May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. So this has been another really eventful week as we all move together towards phase three of Rhode Island's reopening plan. We see people out in the street now, walking around on Thames Street, shopping, mostly wearing masks, and small groups are sitting on the sidewalks and the newly created sitting areas that all the restaurants have done to have outdoor dining. We have, we have two of them backing up right up to our house on the side. Our manual reopening planning group has been meeting by Zoom every week with homework for all of us in between. And we have to remember that just like the altar guilds were washing and ironing and starching altar cloths and ordering wafers, this work that the reopening planning group is doing is holy at the same time that it's completely holy ordinary. We know that God is in all of the details as we plan sanitizing stations, mark distances between people, and gather up our extra face masks. We're learning a new way of life, right? One that's safer during COVID tide, however long that season lasts, and that protects all of us from a virus that we can't even see until we see someone, someone, a person, it is affected. Everything is so different now. We wear face masks, we stand six feet apart, we have our temperatures scanned, and we answer health questions before we go in to go to a restaurant, or for the lucky ones among us who finally got a haircut last week after four months. All of this extra process is for a danger that we can't even see. We see nice weather when we can all be outdoors now. We see people in small groups walking or sitting on the beach or at restaurants. And we see that crisp blue sky over the Pell Bridge and all the sails out in the harbor sailing over water sparkling like a thousand diamonds. Everything looks familiar, right? Just fine, beautiful even. It doesn't look like there's anything wrong. And sometimes I catch myself wondering, I don't know if this happens to you, but I catch myself wondering with all of these new precautions, trainings, warnings that have become part of our lives now so suddenly and all to guard against an invisible threat when everything looks just fine, whether we really need all of this preparation and concern. But when I see someone, a person or a whole family that COVID has affected, like say a healthcare worker who hasn't seen her family in person for four months because she's trying to keep them safe, or a loved one who has died from COVID, then I know it's not all fine out there, no matter how it looks. The coronavirus is real and it affects all of us, even though we can't see it until it causes devastating illness, economic shutdown, political division, and tears at the very fabric of our human family. As we've moved toward reopening the church, during this season of COVID time, we've also experienced the continuing race protests, funerals and memorial services for George Floyd and Rayshard Brooks. The pandemic of systemic racism like coronavirus is also difficult to see. It's hard to detect in a system that is the very infrastructure of our society. We didn't plan it, cause it, or even want it. None of us did. But we all inherited this foundational societal system, both those who have enjoyed its advantages and 
never realized those advantages didn't result from their own hard work and luck, and those who will never see any luck at all in their lives, no matter how hard they work. We all inherited this system. Systemic racism is so familiar to us, so integral to our experience and society, it's as invisible as water is to a fish. It's just the environment we breathe and swim in, the world as we've always known it, that we inherited and didn't plan or cause and would never ask for. But systemic racism, just like COVID, is excruciating to watch when we do see it and recognize that it tears at the fabric of our human family. Jesus tells us that in Matthew's Gospel today. He's talking about empathy. He's talking about sharing pain and seeing, really seeing how life affects other people and responding to that pain just like you would if it happened to your own loved one. Jesus is talking about really seeing others, how their lives are, and caring about that, just like you would for your own family or for Jesus himself, because we're all connected. Jesus said, whoever welcomes you welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. Whoever welcomes a prophet in the name of a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And whoever welcomes a righteous person in the name of a righteous person will receive the reward of the righteous. And whoever gives even a cup of water to one of these little ones in the name of a disciple, truly, I tell you, none of these will lose their reward. In the name of, as a phrase, is a Semitic expression from the Semitic Peninsula in the Middle East, that includes all of, of Israel, state of Israel now, Samaria, Judah. It's a Semitic expression that means because one is. So here's what Jesus is saying. Whoever welcomes a prophet because that person is a prophet, whoever welcomes a righteous person because that person is a righteous person, and whoever gives even a cup of water to one of these little ones, because he is a disciple of mine, is really seeing that other person as a prophet, as a righteous person, and is truly being a disciple. The writer of Matthew's Gospel remembers that Jesus repeated this one idea three times here. When repetition happens in scripture, it's usually because the idea is really important and it's difficult to do or believe or see. Here's what Jesus says. One, welcome a prophet because he's a prophet. Prophets can be a royal nuisance. They point out things you don't want to see and tell you things you didn't want to hear. Remember Mary June Nestler's great sermon last week about Jeremiah, the weeping prophet. Welcoming a prophet because he's a prophet is a real commitment. And it means that you're open to change and ready to see the way you know and the way things have always been may need to change. Prophets point out where you might have missed something and how you understand things. Two, welcome a righteous person because he is righteous. That's the second thing Jesus says in this passage. If you can recognize someone who is righteous and welcome that person into your life, even when his or her view is different from yours, you've left space for new ways of thinking, seeing and hearing, You've left space for God to open your heart and to change you. Three, give even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones. What's the point of this phrase? Hospitality is at the very root of our Christian faith. 
Remember that the word hospitality coming from the Greek means literally the love of the stranger. Philoxenia, phil for love, oxenia or xenia, stranger as in xenophobic. It's interesting that in Swahili, for example, mgeni, the word mgeni, means both stranger and guest. There's something in that. Welcoming someone into your life and into your home, like welcoming a prophet or even just a righteous person, can disrupt your life. What if one came to your house today? Do you have a guest room? An extra bed? Maybe a pull-out couch in your living room? What do prophets eat, for goodness sake? And how much? I mean, remember John the Baptist ate locusts and wild honey. Do they even have locusts in the Middle Eastern section at the stop and shop? And he wore scam camel skin clothes. I mean, come on, surely they shed more than a Labrador. The point is that Jesus knows that none of this is easy. Having a prophet around, or even a righteous person, could become costly to more than just the weekly grocery budget. You could have to change your long set point of view and way of life. But then Matthew's Jesus says this, if you give even a cup of water, even a cup of cold water, the smallest, easiest, and least costly way there is to show hospitality, even in places where water is scarce. The love of the stranger, that hospitality, if you show it with even a cup of water to these little ones, you will not lose your reward. Jesus is telling us that he knows this is difficult. But loving the stranger and seeing humanity in others and having empathy for their experience, just like we would for our own loved ones, is the very heart of following him. I was listening to one of Krista Tippett's On Being podcasts last week as I was walking in the early morning down by the harbor. She described this paradox of story, and maybe it'll sound familiar to you. I found it helpful. What she said was the more we get into telling our stories to each other and to ourselves and to listening to the stories of others, the more particular they are, the more detailed and particular they are to the experience of the individual, ironically and paradoxically, the more they grab, uh, grip us and grasp us and make sense to us. It's the particular parts of those stories, the unique parts that show our individual experiences and the way our world is that connect us together as human beings. That interconnection is our grace in these days, the presence of Jesus among us, the holy potential in our Christian love of the strange. Is this easy and comfortable? No, Jesus knows it's not. Having a prophet around can be a royal pain, but if we leave that space, maybe make up the bed in the guest room of our hearts for the righteous, for a prophet, for the stranger, when we leave space for God and room in our hearts for seeing something in a new way, we are one human family.